<clears throat> glad to be here. We got an hour. I'm Southern, but I can talk fast. <laughs> and I'm a storyteller. I want to take you with me on a journey. And you start it out for yourself. And when I started out as a child, as Bill Cosby used to say, and in my high school years, in a Catholic high school, traditional teaching, Catholic church, most mainstream Christian uh, teachings, death penalty was all right. We needed the death penalty. In fact, the traditional teaching of the Catholic church was that it's a form of self-defense for society. Some people have done these unbelievably violent crimes against innocent people. In order to protect society, we had, the state had the right to take their life. In fact, it was what we had to do because it's the only way really you could effectively protect people. I didn't question it. In fact, when I was growing up in Baton Rouge, Louisiana had a portable electric chair. Not too far, not too many blocks from St. Joseph Academy where I was going to high school was people were being executed in the electric chair for crimes, for murders, even for the crime of rape. And then, of course, mostly it was African-American men accused of raping white women. And I don't know Buscat about the death penalty. It never came up in religion class. I never thought about it. I joined the, the sisters, taught, and, and, and Bill's right. It all unfurled when I came to understand. For me, it was a deep religious understanding that, about the gospel of Jesus, that Jesus wasn't on the side of the comfortable people and the people who were doing all right. He was on the side of the marginated ones, the ones people hated, the ones people even considered scum. And, and the, the religious hierarchy of the day and the temple wouldn't even eat with them or be seen with them or allow them to touch them or come to them. And Jesus was with them, the outcast, the marginated people. Translate that to people of today. And who would Jesus be having supper with? And when I got it, I realized I was living out in the suburbs. You know the people you saw in the Superdome after Katrina? You know that moment when the whole nation, in fact, the whole world was riveted on the Superdome? Here you have a major city of the United States has a major disaster happen. And over 90,000 people were not included in the evacuation plan to evacuate the city who didn't have cars and who were poor and who couldn't get out. And they were the ones left in the Superdome. Well, when I realized about the gospel of Jesus, that's the people I moved into the St. Thomas Housing Project to learn from and to live among and to serve in 1981. My awakening happened in 1980. And when you awaken to something, to a new dimension of something, it's important to act. You may not say, I'm going to go change the whole world, but you got to, to me, for me, integrity meant I got to act. I moved out of the suburbs into St. Thomas and I'm seeing like the whole underside of the fabric of the great American dream. I didn't dream this was going on. And people, how can things be going on in our inner cities all across this country? And, and we don't know about them. We, we in our little circle and we're going to our college, we're with our friends and, and it can all be happening and we're removed from seeing it. Well, there are a number of reasons, and we won't get into all those. I want to tell you my story, and that when I was in St. Thomas, and I saw what was happening to people who were indigent and African American, and I saw what happened when they were coming into the adult learning center who had dropped out of high school and came in to get their GED, and we'd give somebody a reading test, a math test, and just see what level they were on. Here comes this kid, 11th grade, going to graduate from high school in one more year and couldn't read a third grade reader. Person after person of these young kids who'd been in the public schools in New Orleans. I heard recently, six months ago, that every one of the kids who got exiled from the uh, hurricane and were in Texas and other places when they did you know, the, the uh, testing to see how the students would do, were all far below the students in Texas. We had miserable public schools in New Orleans. Maybe a, one of the a breaks, there was a family I heard of that went to Michigan, and they go, wow, we can't believe it. Man, the kids are in good schools, and wow, we got a decent house and, and a decent wage. They're in Michigan. There, there are systems 
that keep people poor and throw racism in on it. And you got a, you're an African American, you got a dialect. So you gonna go and follow the little ant thing and go get and be, say, I'd like to be a receptionist for this dentist's office. They're not gonna hire you to be the receptionist. I had concrete experience of that with a young woman who was very bright, got her GED, tried to get her a job. She couldn't get it, she was a black person. She had a black dialect and I, she couldn't get the job. I learned all kinds of stuff. I didn't know before. It's like another America. While I'm there, one day, this friend from the prison coalition office, we bump into each other on St. Andrew Street, right in front of Hope House, and he says, hey, Sister Helen, you want to uh, be a pen pal, somebody on death row? It was 1982. Now, we hadn't executed anybody in Louisiana for almost 15 years. There had been an unofficial moratorium across the whole United States. We thought the death penalty was finished in 1972 when the Supreme Court found it unconstitutional. Because they said the way it's applied is so arbitrary and it's like being hit by lightning. It's, this, this isn't law. There's no predictability in it. And they had overturned it. We thought it was over. There had been a moratorium. He asked me in, in 82, hey, well, hey, you want to write to this guy? I go, yeah, sure. I thought I could write letters. I never dreamed they were going to kill this man. I never dreamed there was going to be an execution, much less that I'd be there. You kidding me? This whole thing unfurled for me. And it's the way I wrote Dead Man Walking. It's, it's just, you can know from the early pages in the book that I didn't know what was going on. So when it unfurls for me, it unfurls for you. I wrote the man. His name is Patrick Sonier. I don't know it's going to change my whole life. And the man wrote back. And I wrote, he wrote. I wrote, he wrote. I find out from his letters he has no one to visit him. He didn't even ask me anything. He didn't ask me to come. He didn't ask me to send him money for cigarettes. I think he was just glad somebody had found him, and he said, I'm just glad to get your letters, but I'm looking at it. And for me, it was a spiritual thing. In the Gospels, the four Gospels, Matthew, where Jesus talks about how you, you, who's really pleasing to God and what it means to love, and they said, I was hungry and you gave me to eat. I was a stranger, you took me in. And I was in prison and you came to me. How many times had I seen that written in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 25? But it never struck me. You know, when we're not ready, it doesn't strike us. You can read the Bible forever. and Maybe it just doesn't hit, doesn't call, there's no spark. Well, I'm writing to this man and I realize he has no one to visit him. And I was praying with those words, and all of a sudden I went, i got to go see this guy. So I write to him, and he writes back. He's so excited he hadn't had a visitor, nobody to see him. Imagine you wake up every morning in a cell, six and a half feet by eight and a half feet, and they're serious about killing you, and you see no one. You're treated like disposable human waste, which is probably in the way a lot of people feel about themselves. They've been condemned to die. Society's telling you, you are so terrible, so inhuman, all kinds of at trials, an animal, disposable human waste, scum, vermin, all these things. At, and here somebody comes and says they'll visit. So he said, look, I'm a Catholic, you're a nun, would you be my spiritual advisor? And I said, yeah, sure. And I filled in the form and never dreaming that he's going to be executed at midnight in the electric chair, two and a half years later. And at six in the evening, everybody's going to have to leave the death house except the spiritual advisor who can be with him to the end, walk with him to the electric chair, pray with him at the end, and be there when he's killed. And I don't know this. I don't know that they're going to kill him. I fill in the form, send it in. And it all then came from that. The exchange of letters. He didn't have anyone to visit him. I said, I'll go visit you. That first visit, and in Dead Man Walking, I take you through each of these experiences. And I'm going to fast forward to a lot of things because I want to take you through the journey of Dead Man Walking, but I also want to take you into the journey of Death of Innocence. I'll visit the man. For the first time when I saw his face, I went, I'm shocked. I'm shocked to see his face because I thought he'd look like a murderer, you know? I mean, he's on death row, he's a murderer. Like, I didn't even know if we'd be able to have a normal conversation. I'd never spent two hours with anybody who killed people before. And I look into his face and I go, sweet Jesus, he's a human being. I mean, you look at his face. And we talked. And 
then I found out in that first visit, thank you, that he had a brother. He had a brother serving two life sentences for the same murder. I didn't know boo scat about legal stuff. My daddy was a lawyer, but when he'd do all that lawyer talk, you got to want to do legal talk. You got to want to get into all that law stuff. Any of y'all here law students? You got to want to do that stuff. But it was my first question about the death penalty. How could you have a murder? One brother gets death, one brother gets life. How does that work? I don't have a clue. So then I began to, to visit both the brothers. And after I was doing that several months, I just didn't want to be naive. I went to the prison coalition office. I said, I want to know the crime. They say, okay, and they pull out all these folders and open up the one on the top of the heap and look at this newspaper, the Daily Iberian. It's in a little town in Acadiana in Louisiana where Cajun people live. And there on the front page are the pictures, the prom picture of a boy, Lloyd LeBlanc, who was 17, Loretta Bourke, a girl, 18. And their picture's on the front page of the paper, not because it won some award, and the terrible headline right next to their faces says, Teenagers Found Murdered. And I read it, and I look into their faces. And now I'm going to encounter the other side. The murder and the victim's family left behind. And the first ripple through me when I saw the outrage, of course, outrage, the reason we struggle with the death penalty morally is who is not outraged when we hear about the death of innocent people? We read about these unspeakable crimes. Here's an elderly woman in her apartment. She's strangled and raped and killed. Here's a mother with her kids in a car hijacked, carjacked by these people who, here are teenagers in this article. They found lying face down by the sugarcane uh, field with bullet holes in the backs of their heads, and then there is the description for me of the two men I'm visiting, Patrick and Eddie Sonier, who killed them. And so the first is, of course, outrage, and so then we go, justice. They sure didn't respect their victims' human rights. These kids were killed in the middle of the night without anybody to help them. Justice means you kill, you die. Equal justice. Is it right that they should live? Their victim's dead forever. One of the victim's families was saying to me, huh, they're on death row? Sister, let me tell you what, we're on death row. Every night when I put my head on my pillow, I'm going to think about my kid. And I wasn't there to protect her. And justice, equal justice, said, now what it means? They killed. They broke the law. They pay. They die. That's it. Besides the outrage, the other thing I felt was guilt, a ripple of guilt like when I read the story, I realized I'm visiting the two people who killed these people's kids. What am I doing? How did I get involved with all this? And then I had a, a nudge. I had an impulse. I said, you know, I ought to go see those parents. I ought to do something for those parents. This is every parent's worst nightmare. Their kids had gone to a football game on a Friday night and they didn't come home. And the newspaper account said how the kids, after the football game, went and parked at a lover's lane near a sugarcane field near St. Martinville, this little town. It was in a dark, abandoned place. And the two brothers were in the field. And they were, had been out rabbit hunting. And then they had their, their guns. And then they just waited. It gets dark. And they, with other teenage couples who had come to this lover's lane, and they had used the same thing. They'd come up to the car. They, they said, we're security people here. They, uh, you all are trespassing. This is private property. Uh, afraid we're going to have to take you to the owners. Um, and then that led to, well, look, tell you what, if the girl has sex with us, uh, we won't report you to the owners, which is unspeakable in itself. Some of these young people had been raped, the girls. Others, they scared him, let him go. But here comes the car. His same technique, same procedure. But something went terribly wrong, along with the whole thing, unspeakable thing of raping young girls. They're found dead. And then when I thought of the parents, there was something in me that said, they're not going to want to see me. I'm the spiritual advisor to the two people who killed their kids. And 
I stayed away. I didn't do anything. I didn't call them. I didn't write them a note. I didn't say, I'm sorry about your daughter. I'm sorry about your son. I did nothing. And I met them at the worst possible time I, you, I could have met victims' families. And the last event before there's an execution in Louisiana is called a pardon board hearing. And it's public. You sign the book when you go in. What side you're on? Are you on the side of the state that wants to carry out the execution? Are you on the side of the victims? Uh, who are usually on that side, or you want to ask for clemency. I mean, it's probably in our society the closest you would come that people who would go into the Roman amphitheater and they'd ask for thumbs up if you want somebody to live and thumbs down if you want somebody to die. I mean, you sign the book. Sometimes when they have the pardon board hearings, they've had different colored chairs. Which side you on? You're going to ask for death? You're going to ask for, for clemency? You're going to ask for life? Is that clear cut? And I, that's when I meet the victims' families. And when I met them, while the pardon board was in voting, uh, we had had that hearing. They were going to make that decision. We were walking outside the building. And I ran into, literally ran into, the two sets of parents. The girl's parents, the Borks, Loretta Borks' parents, and David LeBlanc, the boy had been killed, her, his parents. The Borks were furious at me. And they just walked past me. They averted their gaze. And I felt their anger, which I deserved. And then right behind them is Lloyd LeBlanc and his wife, Eula, his son David had been killed. And surprise, you know, human beings have a way of popping out of boxes. And they walk right up to me. And inside, I'm expecting their anger. And here Lloyd LeBlanc says, sister, sister, this is my wife. It was our son David. He said, sister, where have you been? All this time, you've been visiting those two brothers, and you never once came to see us. We had nobody to talk to, and this is what blew me away. He said, you don't know the pressure we're under about the death penalty. I'm going, what? I mean, I just had a flat assumption anybody who has their kid murdered is going to want the death penalty, period, hands down. And there are a lot of pressures in society to, to also bolster that in them because I have known along these years of being with victims' families, like Marietta Yeager, whose daughter was killed and she was not for the death penalty, and she had another victim's family say to her, well, it's a shame you didn't love your daughter the way we love ours. You don't even want the death penalty. Didn't you love your child? Because they equate it with asking for the ultimate penalty means that's the way you honor your child. And if you're not willing to ask for an ultimate penalty, some must be lacking somewhere. And I just said, Miss Sabah, I'm so sorry. I, I never did this before. I, uh, I didn't think you'd want to see me. It was so lame. It was so pitiful. And he said, sister, you don't know what I think till we talk. He said, you come. You come pray with me in this little chapel. And so I did. And so then I met, for the first time, a man who had lost his only son and who was a living embodiment of the gospel of Jesus. I tried to live my whole life. And he wasn't a wacko either. Sometimes you hear these people saying, oh, yeah, I forgive the one who killed my child. Praise Jesus. And you go, these people have not sorted it through. Because <laughs> there's a journey you go on. And when people very glibly go, oh, yes, I forgive and all this, you go, what? Say, what? Wait a minute, wait. And you know they're traumatized. You know they're, they're trying to be their best selves. So here's this man, and we pray together, and I find out he's, as he prays, he's praying for everybody, not only for his son and his wife who almost went crazy, and their family and the Bork family, but then he's praying for Pat and Eddie's mama, Miss Sonia. She couldn't even go into the town. You ever think? that when a society hates a person so much that they say they can kill them, what happens to the mother, the father, the brothers and sisters of the person who's going to be executed? Just the public hatred of a person that says they should not be allowed to live. So people are cutting up dead animals, throwing them on Miss Sonia's porch. She goes in the grocery store. She can't go anymore to the grocery store because she could hear people saying, there she is, that white trash woman. Her son's killed those teenage kids. So she becomes like a little hermit. And here Lord LeBlanc is praying for her. And, and when he brought me through it, of the journey he had been on, it's the first time I understood 
someone who had been thrown into the fire, lost his only son. He said, people in this, in our culture here in the United States think forgiveness is weak, like, oh, you condone it. They kill my son, I'll forgive you, which means I condone what you did. He said, condone it. Every time David has a birthday, we lose him all over again. I almost lost my wife. For three years, I came home. It was like coming home to a morgue. We had to change David's grave. We had buried him in a family plot in a little town near here. We had to, to bury him in a graveyard nearby so Eula can visit his grave every day. I almost lost my wife along with losing my son. Condone what they did. But then he said, I'm a loving man. I'm a kind man. They kill my son, but I'm not going to let them kill me. And he said, Jesus said to forgive, and that's what I'm going to do. And the first time I learned, forgiveness embodied in Lloyd de Blanc meant, I will not let the love that lives inside me be killed by this hatred. And, and I then will do, and that's what he meant by, I'll do what Jesus said. And he began then to walk that road. He was the first one I learned from. Mrs. Saunier in the town, of course, barely ventured out. Teenagers would drive around her house at night yelling, Mother the murderer, mother the murderer. One day she hears somebody on her porch. And she looks at the blinds and sees a man is there, and he has something in his hands. And she looks carefully. She walks around to the door and opens it. And it's Lloyd LeBlanc. And he's got a basket of fruit. And he gives it to her, and he said, Miss Le uh, Sonia, I know you're having a tough time in this town. I want you to know I'm a parent, and parents never really know what their kids might do because they're individuals, and I don't hold you responsible for what your sons did to our boy. And he said, you need anything, you call me. He is the hero of Dead Man Walking. And so through him, I began to accompany murder victims' families, realize most people are leaving them alone. I wasn't the only one. Because people don't know what to do with their pain, and so they avoid them. And they need real help. They need real community. They need healing. They need help when they lose their jobs because they can't focus, and then they need to get help. They need counseling. Whatever fault line is in a marriage between two parents who lose a child, over 70% of them get divorced after they lose their child. The whole family, one of uh, the, the young girl in one of the families whose sister was killed, she said, I lost my life and my parents after my sister was killed. It was always about her, always about her, the anniversary of her death, her birthday. I got lost in the crowd. Well, I'm, I'm one of their children, too. People break all apart. And the death penalty can split a family right down the middle. I thought everybody at least would agree in a family, yeah, we've had this terrible murder, so we're together in this. Wrong. There was a family in Baton Rouge who lost their sister who was murdered in Houston. And the boys in the family were all for the death penalty. They sent in letters to the editor and saying they want to pull the switch. The daughters in the family don't want the death penalty. The poor mother then has her children not talking to each other because they disagree about the death penalty. What made us think that families are monolithic and if you give the death penalty, you're really going to help heal this family and bring it together? Not to mention the fact that they're going to wait 15, 20 years for this justice, so-called justice, to be done, where they get to come sit now in the front row and watch it as the state kills the one who killed their loved one and that's supposed to heal them? Listen, though, to how it's presented to us when you hear politicians talk. We're doing this for the victim's family, justice for the victim, to honor these people's dead child demands that we ask for the death penalty. Who are you doing it for? And this is from the voices of the victims' families that have taught me this. Just think about it. Just let me bring you there. When you read Dead Man Walking or if, or if you see the film, Tim Robbins, that's not an anti-death penalty film, Dead Man Walking. He just takes you over to both of these sides like I'm doing right now, and you sort it out. Sort it out. And... That's what the arts are about. It's about reflection. That's what an education's about. It's about reflection. And it's supposed to be also what religion is about. Because the core of every religion, be it Buddhist, no matter what it is, Christian, is that we are all brothers and sisters and we can't cut anybody out of the web of life. 
much less set ourselves up as, as the judges who are going to decide through our little system of justice who lives and who dies. So with the victim's family on one side, and then I'm with this man as he is executed. I'm with him after two and a half years. I watch the protocol of death. I talk to the guards in the death house. I never thought, somebody's got to do the killing. When I'm there with Pat and Pat in the last days, I'm having conversations with the guards. Somebody's got to do the killing for us. In Utah, do they still shoot people here? You still have? Well, yes, no? It's an option, okay. Well, think of the executioners. Now, why is it that when they have the guns, they put a, one has blank? Why? Why do they do that? Uh, we know why we're doing the death penalty. We say we're going to call people to account. Why do you got to have anonymity? Why do, why do you hide the face of the execution? Why do we do that? You know, you've just had to talk about Robert Johnson. I'm sure he brought you through a lot of this in terms of death work and the really good stuff he's done there. But I'm in there. I've never been in a death house before. They had the huge generator. First three people I was with who were executed were electrocuted to death. And you go to the death house. It's the most, Susan Sarandon, all while we were filming, kept calling it surreal. And it absolutely is surreal. They got geraniums growing right outside the door. And you go in, the tiles are all polished, coffee pots percolating. They were typing up the witnesses' forms. You could hear like the click, click, click. In those days, it was still typewriters before we had to click, click, click. You can hear somebody typing. It sounds like a business office. And we're clicking down the hours to the time of the execution at midnight. And people are polite. They're polite. They're coming in, hey, Pat, you need anything? You want a volume? You need a cigarette? They want him to go peacefully. Because the guards have practiced for this minute, for, the time, for this execution. They've had guards take, like, his place, his height, his build, and they practice when he goes peacefully, and they practice when he fights them every inch of the way so that then they can do their job. They become very task-oriented. This last execution with Dobie that happened in the Louisiana death house, the, a guard pulled me aside, and he said, it's always like this. It's always poor people in here that we kill him and saying goodbye to his family, African-American. It's always like this. I tell the story of a major who was a supervisor on death row and about how he was on this, they call it the TAC team. Some call it the, uh, the executions uh, team. And he, after five executions, he called me in his office one day and he said, sister, I can't do it anymore. Look, I know what these guys have done. I know every one of them on death row. Some of their crimes were unspeakable. But he said, my job wasn't even to strap them down. It was just to take a paper sack after they were executed and collect their personal belongings to give to their family, their toothbrush and their clothes. And, and he said, I come home after these executions and I get in my lazy boy chair and I can't eat and I can't sleep. And my gut tells me I'm killing somebody who's defenseless. And they can tell me all they want, that it's legal and it's the court of the law and I'm just doing my job. And he quit, quit his job. The only one I met. Then I'm with this man, Pat, and the clock's ticking and his life is pouring out. And he was, as one of the guards put, put it, and Pat was the first man I was with. He was deeply remorseful for what happened. He said, when, if you look at Dead Man Walking, now Matthew Ponsolet is a composite character of Patrick Sonier the first and a much tougher guy, Robert Willie, the second person in Dead Man Walking. Patrick Sonier was the one who said, when they dim the lights and the tear at midnight, I kneel down by my bunk with my Bible and I pray for those kids. That was never supposed to happen. And if you read the story, you'll see that of the two brothers, Patrick was executed. Eddie is the one who shot and killed them that night in a very emotional state when it happened. And you'll, you'll have to read the book to get the story. But I'm with this man now, that, and it's serious that they are going to kill him. And so I'm telling you, my heart, every time the phone would ring in the death house, see, normally a phone call is a pretty innocuous thing. But that phone call means it can be the phone call from the court saying he got a stay of execution and he's going to live, or it can be the phone call 
at which those calls ended up being that day that every court had turned him down, the governor turned him down. And only by about 8 o'clock at night did I know for sure that he really was going to die. And in the death house, they have two red telephones, and one is to the courts, and one is to the governor's office in case there's a last-minute reprieve. And I'm with him. And he says to me, Sister, you can't be there at the end. He said, look, you visited me all these years. And it was dignity, see? I think that's a gift. I just gave him dignity. I didn't condone what he did. He knew that. I was horrified at what he, he did. But I think it was that I could see that he was worth more than that one act, that that was not his essence. And he never claimed to be innocent because he was involved with Eddie with those kids. And one night, Eddie went haywire, and he had the gun, and he shot and killed him. And I think Pat always felt responsible. I think he, he didn't say, but I do not believe he was guilty of first-degree murder. But believe me, I've learned, and you see in the second book, The Death of Innocence, we got, we have a very imperfect, frail, human, flawed 